Shabbat Shalom. Last Shabbat was observed with a special name, Shabbat Zachor, the Sabbath of memory. And perhaps in a different time and place, I would have riffed on that memory being a hundred years of women being called to the Torah as bat mitzvah, which we are act actually celebrating on this Shabbat. Um, it would have been an upbeat sermon uh, to celebrate the contributions, a century of contributions um, since we celebrated Mordechai Kaplan calling his daughter to Torah as a bat mitzvah. But instead tonight, I am going to focus on the traditional elements of Shabbat Zahor, the Sabbath of memory, which was the name again last Shabbat for the Sabbath in preparation for Purim, a Sabbath on which we recall Haman's ancestry, King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, now, in case you have forgotten, or perhaps never were there for this particular lesson, the Amalekites, or as they're usually known in the Torah, Amalek, one name, Amalek, as the Torah prefers to refer to this nation, Amalek was the villain of the Hebrew Bible. The Amalekites are mentioned briefly in the book of Exodus, and then with a little expansion in the book of Deuteronomy. So in Exodus 17, Amalek, and this is in between leaving, right, Exodus 17, what does that tell you? Exodus 15, we cross through the Red Sea. Exodus 20, we're at Sinai and the Ten Commandments. So Exodus 17, we're in between those two things, right? We're not slaves in Egypt, but we haven't entered into the covenant yet with God. We're sort of in that 50-day countdown period, right? Exodus 17, Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, pick some men for us and go out and do battle with Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. That's the rod that split the sea. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Moses' brother Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It was a vantage point. Then whenever Moses held up his hand with the rod in it, Israel would prevail. But whenever he let down his hand, the Amalekites prevailed. Moses' hands start to grow heavy. It's a lot of work to hold up that rod, right? He's 80 years old, he's not a youngster. His hands would grow heavy. So they took a stone and they put it under him as a seat, and he sat on it, while Aaron on one side and her on the other side supported his hands. Thus his hands remained steady until the sun set, and Joshua overwhelmed the Amalekites. Then the Eternal said to Moses, inscribe this in a document as a reminder. By the way, it's the first time the Israelites are told to write something down, and read it aloud to Joshua. I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You know like how every year we stamp out Haman's name? I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven, except it's written in the Torah, so we're always reading it. And Moses built an altar and named it Adonai Nisi. The eternal will be at war with Amalek throughout the ages. A strange sentence. I'm going to wipe out the Amalekites, but you're going to be at war with them forever. Further on in Deuteronomy 25, we read, remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt. How undeterred by fear of God, he surprised you on the march when you were famished and weary and cut down all the stragglers in your rear. Therefore, when the eternal your God grants you safety from all your enemies around you in the land that the eternal your God is giving to you as a hereditary portion, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So you better remember. Do not forget. 
Most of the historical events concerning the Amalekites are further narrated in the prophetic books, the Haftarot. In the book of Samuel, the prophet of the same name, Samuel, commands King Saul, the first king, to proscribe the Amalekites after the Israelites are victorious against them in battle. But, here's a big but, it's why Saul loses his kingship, Saul extends kingly courtesy to Agog, king of the Amalekites, leading Samuel, the prophet, to take matters quite literally into his own hands. It is, of course, that same Agag, king of the Amalekites, who we read about as the ancestor, somehow, of the Persian megalomaniac Haman on Wednesday evening and Thursday. For we moderns, who view Haman as a fictional character in a historical novella, the historic reality of a flesh and blood national enemy, Amalek, is both confusing and troubling. It reminds us that significant portions of Hebrew scriptures are indeed a historical reminiscence, if not exact history. National conquest and bloodshed were real, and they are as old as humanity. Rather than focusing, as would be typical, on the antiquity of anti-Semitism tonight, that's the usual sermon when talking about Purim and Haman and Amalek, I want to instead focus on the Torah's insight that it doesn't take very much for a single national leader to undertake massive bloodshed inexplicably and overnight. In the case of Haman, we know that it is motivated by an irrational hatred of Mordecai and is built on Mordecai's momentary refusal to bow and acknowledge Haman's political superiority. From this, an entire genocidal extermination is born. In the case of the Amalekites, we don't know their motivation, but we are told that even in the ancient world, their military action was far beyond any acceptable bounds. As we read, how undeterred by fear of God, meaning immorally, Amalek surprised the Israelites on their march when they were famished and weary and cut down all the stragglers at the rear. Rabbinic commentary makes clear that um, Amalek, the Amalekites, attacked defenseless and starving non-combatants, women and children, the elderly, and the disabled. It wasn't a military strategy. It was barbarism and atrocity, savagery and brutality, all for its own sake. And yet, what I believe is instructive in this reminiscence is the Torah's description of how Moses and Israel succeed, however momentarily, in their battle against the Amalekites. Moses says, I will station myself on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And we read, then whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel would prevail. But whenever he let down his hands, the Amalekites prevailed. Moses' hands grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur, one on each side, supported his hands. Thus, his hands remained steady. Really, you could translate arms, remained steady until sunset, and thus Joshua was able to overwhelm Amalek. That image of Moses' hands holding up the rod is, of course, a mighty metaphor. As long as Moses held up his rod, Joshua succeeded against the Amalekites in battle. But whenever Moses' strength or attention flagged, his arms lowered the rod and the Amalekites prevailed. It's hard for me not to hear echoes of the attri warning attributed to Thomas Jefferson, it's not really Jefferson, that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. In other words, you've got to keep your arms up, Moses, no matter what. 
In many ways, we moderns do not live in a radically different world than our ancestors. We certainly do not live in Mashiach's sight, the world to come, when humanity will be, as promised, perfected, and history, world events, will come to an end. No, we still live in a violent and imperfect world. It is and has been all too easy, I think, over the past generation to think differently and to think that perhaps we could let our arms down. But the price of hoping and imagining that others would not take advantage of that is all too apparent at this moment in human history. For we Jews, zachor, zecher, memory, our attentiveness to the patterns of history is how we have and how we continue to survive in a world that we have been reminded can tip into violence suddenly and unexpectedly. We are about to read aloud from our great Jewish family memoir, the Haggadah, in a month. It records and reminds us each Passover at the Seder as we read, you raise your wine glass for this one, not only Pharaoh arose against us to annihilate us, but in every generation there have been those who rise against us. This isn't a lesson solely for the Jewish people. Despots, tyrants arise in every location and in every generation. As that great philosopher George Santayana taught, those who cannot remember the past will be condemned to repeat it. And it seems that, frankly, we do, again and again, over and over. We can see now with 2020 vision that our modern day Moseses and Joshua's, Aaron's and hers, the leaders of the nations of today's world, haven't always wished to expend their energies and resources keeping their arms up, containing such dangers. It seems at least to my inexpert sight, that they have preferred at times to let their arms down. And today we live with the consequences as a potential world war, perhaps, looms in the periphery, and as the lives of Ukraine's 41 million citizens hang in the balance. Help us, O oh God. Help us to remember, to never forget, Remind us that peace will not fall like rain, nor shine like the sun. For peace is not a state of being, it is an accomplishment earned by effort. One that is hard to achieve and too easily lost. And that the price of forgetting is born on the backs of innocence. Shabbat Shalom.